Thank you, Julien, and to our speakers, Gabriela and Christian. The inclusive design of AI is indeed a very important topic, not just to minimize bias, but also to deploy AI to be a force for inclusion. Now, from medical AI, to, we move to mental health. You may not normally associate the word vulnerability with power, but to address trauma and mental health issues for women, we can find new ways to increase well-being for all. I'd like to introduce you to two women who are themselves opening their minds and hearts, as well as, well as the minds and hearts of others through their work. I am here today with Her Highness Sheikha Intisar Al Sabah, founder of the Intisar Foundation, a UK-based humanitarian organization that provides Arab women with psychological support through drama therapy, as well as Ulrich de Kohn, Group Head of Communication, Brand and Corporate Responsibility for AXA, a company that is really committed to supporting women when, when well-being and mental health globally through specialized initiatives and research. Ulrike, Her Highness, over to you. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, Your Highness, it's really an honor to be having this conversation uh, with you today. I was, I was extremely impressed and, and very inspired by when you told me uh, uh, yesterday we, we spoke and, and I just, you know, you told about the amazing work that you're doing uh, on, on the topic of, of mental well-being uh, with women who are uh, living in what you self called some of the most troubled places on, 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 this, on this earth. So I, I would really love by starting the conversation with hearing about this very innovative approach you've taken to, uh, to tackling uh, and addressing uh, trauma psychology through drama. Uh, and, and how you're implementing this with your organization. Thank you so, so much, Ulrike. And uh, yeah, it is very interesting we do, what we do because it's so out of the box for, uh, the Arab, for definitely the Arab world. Uh, I was uh, inspired by a round table to uh, to, to look at what was being given to women psychologically, especially Arab women affected by war psychologically. And when I realized there was very little or sometimes zero uh, support given, I realized I had to do something. And uh, that's when we started looking at different modalities of psychological support. And uh, we stayed with drama therapy because of its 360 approach to uh, supporting uh, the recipient and in our case it's the women and what we've realized is with cycle with drama therapy the women gain their voices gain their um they, they they they're they're okay with being seen they're okay with being out there with being um in a way when you're affected by war, if you think of war, most women and children are told to hide and be quiet. And so what, what drama therapy does is a complete opposite. It makes them come out and be center stage. And in that, there is a lot of letting go of previous emotions, but the reason they're able to let go is they go into the most vulnerable, vulnerable place in them. So the place where they have the most shame, the most um, fear, everything. And by going into that, they discover, oh, my God, we've done it. We've survived. We are stronger than we actually thought we are. And we've seen huge uh, changes in the women that uh, we've worked with. Uh, I'll be sharing some data later on, but uh, psychological changes, they become more uh, uh, mental. Mentally, they're able to handle life in a much better way. And also, we've seen uh, a big number of them realize that they can be entrepreneurs, so they started their own businesses. So it's been really interesting how the women are changing. And I won't say all. But the majority have been able to, if not stop, then to a big degree minimize abuse inflicted on them and also stop abusing their children. The cycle of violence, you know, abuse people abuse, 
they've been able to stop it. Our women are magnificent. And with drama therapy, they, they discover their magnificence. And I'm so proud to be able to offer that to them as a foundation. And uh, yes, drama therapy is strange as a, a tool for empowerment or a tool for um, social behavioral change, but it is amazingly efficient. And it's like a magic wand for uh, the women we work with because they've done other modalities of, of uh, uh, you know, they've done workshops, they've done other, psycho not, if not psychological, they've done empowerment, they've done family planning, they've done um, all these workshops about how they have rights, but they don't get it. But with drama therapy, it's a three-pronged, so in the, in the beginning, it's a body movement, and then the body movement leads to connecting with your emotions. And after connecting with the emotions, then you start uh, understanding the more, having a cognitive recognition of the incident that you, uh, the women went through and also being able to talk about it. So this triangle is what allows drama therapy uh, as an intervention to be so much more powerful than normal interventions. And uh, speaking of uh, data, I would like to share with you a few things that we've uh, been able to measure using drama therapy with our women. So 68% of our participants experienced reduction in PTSD, 93 experienced reduction in depression. 75 experienced reduction in anxiety, 78 experienced increase in self-esteem, 43% experienced improvement and satisfaction with life. And we're able to give this, uh, these, this, uh, these numbers because we believe in research, we believe in data collection, we believe that to, to, we have to measure everything to verify the impact it has, or if it's not impactful, then we can change it. So we're very happy to uh, have the first research of its kind in the Arab world on, um, where, on the effect of or the impact of drama therapy. And we're working now on a bigger research on the neuroscience of drama therapy on women. Yeah. So this is uh, a few things that we've been doing. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, I want. I mean, maybe I can go one, on forever. I uh, no, but I think forever. yeah, and we could I could listen on for forever as well. I think one one of the 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 aspects which really uh, uh, I found extremely interesting is also the way you explain how. Of course, you're working with those women for their individual well-being, but how, and you have started to tell it, how it also brings about uh, social change uh, in the broader community. And I think that's one of the wonderful things of working with women is that um, because they're so intertwined with, you know, their families, the communities. So maybe you can describe how this approach also you've, you've witnessed, you know, really a broader collective change. Thank you for that question because see it makes me smile that question because I that's see. one of one of one of the big breakthroughs we've had again. Uh, collecting data allowed us to do this. So uh, we always have a research by the a researcher by the way in the when when, when the program is being done every time every day just to make sure that the data is always collected because that gives us insight on what needs to be done, what needs to improve, what needs to be changed. So. When we started working, we were looking at a, a few thousand women to support in, the, in, in Lebanon and Jordan. And then when we started getting the data, looking at how the women were changing and listening to them, what we realized, the, the impact was beyond just the woman. The woman was impacted, and then what happened was she was able to empower her children. She found peace within herself. She stopped abuse on her. She stopped abusing her children. And she also was more collaborative. 
with the other women and they formed a support system. So what we decided immediately after that is we're not moving from where we are until we have 10 to 14 percent of the women going through the program in order to support the bigger community. And that's why we've changed to one million Arab women that will bring peace to, their, to themselves, to their families, to their societies and to the Arab world all in all. And we couldn't have done that if it wasn't for all the data that we collected and all the insights we got out of the data. And, uh, you know, we were speaking the other day, we spoke about also how AXA was able to collect so much data to be able to uh, do this amazing research. So if you can tell us a little bit about the research you've done and yeah, the impact I, of COVID on women. Of course. Yeah, um, you, you're right. I, actually, we have this program at AXA uh, for now uh, five, four to five years, which is really addressing what we call the protection gap that women face across, uh, you know, several markets. And for us, it was very important, even though the crisis is not over, to try to understand, as you know, already now, what has been uh, the impact on their on their health and well-being. And I and I think we're very much on the same uh, belief as you that we need to take a holistic approach, and that the the impact on their health. Uh, is not only on their physical health. We know that women have been overexposed to the virus throughout the world, but also what we call the hidden cost of this crisis for the well-being of women, which is around their, their mental well-being. It, it's very important before I share some numbers that to say that, of course, men and women have been hit psychologically uh, by this crisis due to the fear of the virus, fear of economic consequences, the lockdowns. But we've seen, for example, across Europe, that there's a 10% difference in men reporting a psychological deterioration versus women. So women have had at least the feeling of suffering more psychologically from this crisis. 70% uh, have reported strong feelings, feelings of anxiety. Uh, a third of the women we surveyed, we surveyed around 8,000 women in eight countries. Um, talked about having uh, more severe depression signs uh, after the crisis. And what struck us as well was how uh, strongly young women, especially young mothers, had been impacted. So when you have those figures, uh, now comes the difficult part. How do you interpret? How do you analyze? So to do that, we have been exchanging with many of our experts, uh, with researchers as well. And I think there are many reasons, but maybe for just three of them, uh, the first one, of course, we should not forget, women have been through the lockdowns overexposed to domestic violence. Uh, you know, we've seen a 60% increase in the calls to uh, hotlines, you know, for, for women uh, subject to, to, to domestic abuse across Europe. That's a very big number. So this is a first explanation. The second is that they clearly are... Um, more worried about the financial impact this crisis will have for them. Uh, we saw, uh, for example, that 50% of them were fearing not to be able to support their children and families anymore. And then there's a third reason, which has to do with uh, their fear of lacking access to healthcare. We've seen that 40% of women have missed regular uh, health checkups, which is really worrying. Uh, three out of four uh, declared that during the crisis they had first try to um, um, serve the, 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 the needs, the health needs of their families. And so one of the things we've done to, to try to support in our way uh, was to expand healthcare services to all, um, you know, for free in several of the markets we were, uh, um, uh, notably telemedicine. You know, telemedicine allows you to get access to healthcare from your home. Women are 60 to 70 percent of the users of telemedicine, at least in, in, in what, what we see in France. Uh, and we have been able to do that also in, uh, in uh, low income countries where we've expanded to one million customers uh, free access to teleconsultation. And lately what we've done as well, because we are so worried about the impact of, of um, mental health issues, uh, in France, we just recently launched a free uh, um, uh, psychological assistance service for everybody. So it's free of charge and it's open to everyone. So I'd wow. say that those are a few of our takeaways from this crisis and wow. actions that we've tried to take. 
Amazing work. Thank you so much for doing that. That's so needed. I wish more corporates would do data collection in order to find solutions. So uh, do you see a shift in how corporates support their employees post COVID or during COVID than they did before? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the answer is clearly yes. I, I've seen them. Um, I don't know if it's a shift, but it's given an acceleration. If you think back uh, to what has happened in 2020, I think uh, the way, uh, you know, most of the private sector uh, and, and most of the companies we've heard about, and it was also the case of AXA, despite being exposed to a, a, a lot of business challenges, you know, on value chain disruption, financial markets collapsing. And, and what you saw was that the first priority was putting their employees in a safe place as much as they could. So for us, it was we're lucky to have a, for all employees the ability to work from home. Uh, in some other sectors, food supply, more industrial sectors, this was not always possible. But we've seen many, many companies really prioritizing the health and safety of their employees. And I think this is a big contribution to the pandemic that the private sector has done. Um, but on top of this, I think when if I look at our experience, we, so we, we were able to have everybody working from, from home, but we realized that this was bringing about new challenges for our employees' well-being, um, you know, the risk of isolation, uh, mental load for young parents, uh, also physical and mental health issues because you don't exercise anymore because you're in a locked uh, environment. So we started having to, to think about how to help them. Uh, we put uh, we opened services in almost all our markets for our employees to be able to access uh, psychological assistance. We gave advice on exercising. So th this has really been something that uh, I think is here to stay. And our, our HR director yesterday announced at the Women Forum a new health and well-being program for all our employees. So I think this has really been an acceleration. And, and maybe one last thing that really also I would like us to take away, uh, it's maybe more a testimony from uh, within the corporate sector, beyond the programs and the priority of, of health for employees, what we've seen is a different conversation uh, at leadership level. So, you know, um, we, we very quickly realized as leaders that maybe, yes, we had to be there uh, to deliver during the crisis, but the first thing that was expected from us was caring about our teams. So, you know, conversations now are starting with, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And, and the role modeling of leaders themselves being able to show vulner vulnerability, to show uh, that it wasn't easy for them either, I think has helped also to lift a bit of that stigma that you were mentioning about being able to open up, to share emotions. And I think that's also a trend that I see uh, staying for the long term in, in leadership in the corporate sector, hopefully at least. I'm sure it will. I mean, one of the things I know we all uh, felt with 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 the pandemic, are more willing to share their experiences than they were before. I know that this is happening on, on our side too. And to the women, they, they quickly open up because of all the fear they had before, so they find opening up much easier than they did before. So, do you find? I mean, are you doing any any uh, research or data collection post COVID? More like uh, from a, a corporate view on what needs to be done in corporates to handle the new mental life health issues that are coming with employees. And Ulrike, this is going to have to be your concluding comments. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very much. I think we are uh, we have we are managing closely uh, measuring the, the level of of well-being of our employees, of, of mental well-being. But clearly, uh, we believe as being a provider of employee benefits worldwide, uh, that we need to help corporates, corporations become better at measuring, also at providing solutions. So clearly, this is a way of development uh, for us. And uh, as always, it has to rely on, on data and on, on research.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ulrike and Your Highness. Please stay on the line for um, one more minute. But I wanted to really thank you for those inspiring words. Uh, I love the point that you both made uh, on the opportunity to create a space for vulnerability and finding through that new ways, new paths for uh, leadership and positive impact. Uh, that was uh, very powerful. And uh, your colleague Ulrike yesterday said it very well, Karima Silvent, when she said that mental health is the shadow pandemic behind COVID. And, and it is definitely disproportionately impacting women. We talked a lot about that. Thank you again for this um, um, wonderful exchange between the uh, two wonderful women. So next, Thank you uh, very to much. tell us um, next, to tell us about the gender-centric response and recovery plan in France is Bruno Le Maire, a finance minister for the French government and a long-standing supporter of the Women's Forum. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to open this second day of the Women's Forum. Yeah, okay. I wish we could all have been gathered today to exchange. I would like to take a minute to warmly thank Chiara Corazza and her team for the tremendous work they have done to organize this forum despite the pandemic. As you know, the French President Emmanuel Macron has set the fight against inequalities and especially gender equality as one of our main priorities. We have made progress in France on gender equality over the last three years. I will focus on the economic side. We passed several legislation to improve gender equality. But I would like to highlight the tremendous work done by Marlene Schiappa and now Elisabeth Moreno to tackle violence against women. This is a prerequisite to any woman economic empowerment policy. First, we have worked on transparency. We built a gender equality index, a composite indicator that French companies with more than 50 employees must publish to evaluate on a yearly basis, aspects related to professional gender equality. Companies have to pay a fine under a certain score. We extended this month the index to all companies benefiting from the financial support of the National Recovery Plan. They will have to publish a score and to set improvement targets for each indicator. I strongly believe transparency on gender equality is key. We have also worked on governance to break the glass ceiling. We have introduced the obligation for companies to have gender equal recruitment process at executive level. It means that at each step of the process, a man and a woman must be interviewed until the final round. It's much easier to have a woman hired at a senior position when there is at least one in the selection process. And I believe we should do the same at all levels. We have also strengthened sanctions against companies which do not respect the bill we passed a decade ago when we introduced a quota of 40% of women on the boards of directors. We are now the country in Europe with the highest number of women sitting on boards. I'm proud of it. It's not just a question of fairness, it's a question of performance and efficiency. Finally, we have worked on work-life balance. We have extended paternity leave from 11 to 28 days and have made compulsory a minimum of seven days off. This is a true progress to improve professional equality between men and women, but also a true progress for future generations. On the international stage, we continue to raise concern on gender inequalities and I believe France has a key role in feminist diplomacy. We set these three priorities last year during the G7 under the French presidency, eliminating sexual and gender-based violence, primarily female genital mutilation, forced marriage and cyberbullying, supporting women's education at a time when two thirds of the illiterate adults worldwide are women. And last but not least, supporting the economic empowerment of women, particularly in Africa and the Sahel, by helping them to fund their projects and business ventures. We also identified 80 measures we could implement to improve gender equality. G7 leaders committed to implementing at least one of these laws of public policies in their country. France committed on four priorities. 
Three out of four has already been achieved. We have organized a national consultation on domestic violence. We have improved support to single mothers and we have set measures to fight against public harassment. The last priority is the law on women economic empowerment, which has been delayed because of the pandemic, but is high on the agenda. However, we need to go further as the pandemic raised a new risk for gender equality. As the President mentioned, it last month at the 25th anniversary of the United Nations Roadmap to achieve equality for women, not a single country has reached the target set by the UN. Many countries, instead of progressing on the matter, are pushing back. This is a wake-up call and we need to work together to achieve this agenda. On top of it, the pandemic increases inequalities. The crisis strikes women more fiercely than men, economically but also in terms of domestic violence, housework and so on. Women are more often employed on short-term contracts or part-time than men. They are more employed in the economic sectors which suffer from lockdown measures such as tourism, activities, restaurants, cafes and shops. Women's economic empowerment is key on the agenda. We have worked on a support plan for hospitals and healthcare workers, including pay raises and revised working hours and conditions for those on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic. But once again, we need to do more. I would like to thank the Women's Forum for their call to action to the G7 leaders with their very relevant proposals on business, future of work, tech for good, work-life balance, governance, climate, health. I take this call to action. We will host in Paris the Generation Equality Forum in the first half of 2021, a forum organized with the United Nations dedicated to gender equality. This even should be an important moment in the international agenda to assess our progress and continue fighting against gender inequalities. I wish you all a great conference. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you very much for the Minister for that thoughtful and engaging explanation. Now, once again, participants, we are offering a choice of three sessions. First, we propose a discussion on the future of work, STEM skills, upskilling, reskilling, and efforts to ensure that diversity, equality are a central part of working life. Second, you have the choice of a finance focus session that looks at how investment and wealth owners can use their influence to tackle climate change and other global challenges. Finally, there is an interactive town hall session on trust in times of crisis, how to earn it, how to lose it, and how to put it to good use. So click on the purple live button at the top of your screen to select which session you'd like to attend, and we'll see you back here afterwards. Enjoy.